There's a passage where the Buddha talks about seven qualities of what he calls a true person or a person of integrity. The Pali term is sat bodhisattva. And they're basically different aspects of discernment. And out of them, only one of them has to do with something you can learn through words. That's having a sense of the Dhamma. You learn what the Buddha taught, you learn what the Ajahns taught. And the other seven have to do with developing your own sensitivity as to how to use these teachings. The second quality starts right in, Atta, having a sense of Atta. This is A-T-T-H-A. -T -T -A. means goal, meaning, purpose. In other words, understanding what the Dharma is for. People can read books and explain the words, but they don't really get to what the Dharma is for. It's for liberation. The Buddha says that release is the both the essence of the Dharma and it's also its flavor. Essence in the sense of the Pali term is the heartwood sara, the, the real core, the real solid part of the Dharma, is what leads to release. And the flavor. You listen to the drama, and it should have a flavor that helps you put down your burdens. But how you do that, that's something you've got to learn for yourself. And we have all the instructions, 16 steps of breath meditation. It seems like a lot, but when you actually look at it, it's not very much. There's an awful lot that you have to use to develop your own sensitivity. The Buddha says, breathe in a way that has that gives rise to rapture, breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. How do you do that? He doesn't say. How do you breathe in a way that makes you aware of the whole body? He doesn't say. All of this is an area where you move beyond the discernment that comes from listening or reading and into the discernment that comes from thinking and developing. In other words, you have to think about the questions. The Buddha poses the questions, so you think about them. Come up with some hypotheses, and then you test them. And then you think about the results. In other words, you ask yourself, are they good? Are they useful? And this is a large part of what sensitivity in the drama means, combining your thinking and your developing of qualities in the mind. So you can get a real sense of what the drama is for. You find that it does lift some of the burdens off of your mind. It makes you a more reliable person, a person who you can trust. Because there's another part of sensitivity as well. How well can you trust your intuitions? You've got to be able to judge them. Think about John Munn out in the forest, who's getting all these visions. Sometimes it'd be Davis or other beings coming and tell, telling him you should practice this way, practice that way. And if he'd believed everything he saw, he would have gone crazy. He realized he had to learn how to forget about whether it was a Deva or whatever that gave the, the lesson. And look at it. To what extent did it fit in with the, what he already knew of the Dharma? And if it looked like it might fit, then he would give it a try. Still not say 100% this is the way it's got to be. And that's how he developed his sensitivity. That's one of the reasons why the Buddha told Rahula, before he started breath meditation, make your mind like earth. The more non-reactive you can be, the more you can see things. And the better judge you are at the various experiments that you do. And then the remaining five qualities beyond having a sense of the Dharma and the sense of its meaning have to do with different aspects of the practice that lie around the meditation. Having a sense of yourself, 
In other words, having a sense of where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, where work needs to be done, and being willing to do it. Think of that old statement that the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. It doesn't mean you don't have any preference for, say, happiness over suffering. You do prefer happiness. It has to do with the means. What do you have to do? There are certain things you've got to do if you're going to find true happiness, if you're going to find release. And some of them go against the grain, contemplation of the body. A lot of people don't like that. The various ascetic practices, restraint of the senses, it goes against the grain. Some people complain that it's unnatural. Well, there is something unnatural about it, but then look where nature goes. Birth, aging, death, birth, aging, death, birth, aging, death. That's natural. We're trying to go against that. We're finding something that is there. It's not that we're creating something out of nothing. But a lot of our natural tendencies, the ones that are really habitual, are not going to take us all the way to release. I know some people say, well, just naturally relax. Everyone likes to relax. We well, relax for a while, and then it gets dull, and then you want some entertainment. As one person once said, having a hand that's relaxed is much nicer than having a hand that's tight, curled up in a fist. But the hand that stays relaxed and doesn't move, that's a dead hand. The nature of the body is it goes back and forth. But the mind doesn't have to go back and forth with the body, and that's what we're working on. So if you notice that you have problems with lust, okay, contemplate the body. See exactly where it is that it's worthy of lust and why the mind wants the lust to begin with. The body is not the problem, but it helps clear at least one of the issues out of the way. Because the mind is going to say, well, that really is beautiful. Why? How can I not lust for it? So you ask about that. Well, where is it really beautiful and where is it not? And what things come along with it? And so as the body gets less and less prominent, then the, the issue of the lust in and of itself becomes more prominent. That's when you can deal with it. Why you want the perceptions that give rise to lust. So whatever your problem is, there is an antidote. And all too often our problem is that we don't like the antidote, so we pretend that it's not a problem. So having a sense of yourself is an important part of gaining discernment. Another quality is having a sense of enough. How much food is enough? How much sleep is enough? How much staying with Tranquility is enough. To, to what extent do you have to start working on insight? And at what point does the insight work become counterproductive? In other words, you don't have the strength of concentration to carry it through. And Jamahaboa talks about this a lot. You find that you sharpened your knife in concentration and then you use, 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 use it. It's going to get dull. You've got to sharpen it again. But if you just stay with a sharpened knife and don't use it, then that's not worthwhile either. So as you go through the day, ask yourself, how much sleep is enough? How much walking meditation is enough? This is something that nobody else can tell you. You've got to figure it out for yourself. You may learn some ideas from other people. The one that I found was that you have at least one good long session of meditation every day, but also learn how to break it up. Give yourself some variety. Then there's a question of having a sense of the right time and the right place. When is the right place to, time and place to talk? When is the right time and place to be quiet? You have to be sensitive to these things, especially when you're living in a community. In fact, that deals directly with the next two, the sixth and the seventh aspects. One is having a sense of groups of people when you enter them. 
what kind of behavior is appropriate for this group of people, what kind of behavior is appropriate for that group of people. With some people you have to use a certain level of language, with other people you have to use another level. With some people there are certain topics you can talk about, with others there are topics you have to stay away from. When you have a sense of communities of people like this, then it's a lot easier to practice. All too often we simply want to say what we want to say without thinking about what kind of impact is it going to have on the long-term health of the community. You have to think about these things. And then finally, it's the sense of who are the people worth hanging around with? The Buddha says you want to hang around with people who are interested in the Dharma. Not only listen to it, but they like to think about it. They like to discuss it, but not too much. That's when you get back into the issue of how much and the right time and place. There are way too many Dharma discussions down at the guest house, down at the kitchen. We're living here as a group, and we want to be able to help one another find some quiet. And then choose the people you want to hang around with. The people, and this is especially important as you leave the monastery. I mean, you're going to be willy-nilly dealing with all kinds of people, but who are the people that you go to for advice? Who are the people you want to emulate? Who's people, who are the people whose point of view you want to develop? You have to develop a sense of this. And as I said, the Buddha doesn't give many instructions on this, but he does raise the issues, and that's important, because all too often we don't think about it. We look at our life in other terms, ask other questions. But learning to ask yourself questions about this, I mean, now that you've learned the Dharma, what's it for? And how do you head in that direction, in terms of finding the right time, having a sense of yourself, having a sense of how much is enough? make a sense of who the people are that you should hang out with, and how you should treat the various groups of people you encounter. It's good that these questions are raised, and you think about them in terms of where are they going to lead in terms of that goal of the Dharma. The most important one of these is the, that second one, the atta, the goal, the purpose of the practice, because that's where the essence lies, that's where the real flavor of this practice lies the extent to which the mind can be released. So think about these issues. Test them in your life, and then think about the results. This is how your discernment grows from simple, simply knowledge of the Dharma to real knowledge of what it's all for. thinking and developing, and then thinking again about what you've developed, and then think, developing things some more. This is back and forth. That's how your sensitivity grows. And your sensitivity is the essence of discernment. If you push it in the right direction, so even though this is a natural process or natural goal that we're named for, it's something there in nature. We have to question our, what seem to be our natural ways of doing things, and subject them to the Buddhist questions. So we can head in a direction where we've never been before, learn something we've never learned before, experience something we've never experienced before. And that comes from doing things we haven't done before. So keep these issues in mind, because they make you sensitive in the areas that really will bear fruit. <laughs>